So I'm wondering whether any of you are feeling particularly hungry right now. Early in the morning, you may or may not have had breakfast. No, you're not hungry? Some are. When you, when you think about your stomach, yes, maybe not. But think of it, the state of your heart or your soul. Are you feeling hungry right now? I would suggest that there is a hunger inside of you that is so persistent that you've actually forgotten that it's even there. It's just this gnawing pain in the background of your life. This emptiness that you've kind of reconciled yourself to and you just experience, well, that's just how it, life is. I do, I do my best to distract myself from it at every moment, but it's always there. Now, that's not a hunger for food. It's a hunger for something much deeper. For love, for validation, for some sense of significance that you, you are worth something. Yeah, in the same way that physical hunger can drive a person crazy, that hunger of the soul does the same thing. You know, we end up hurting each other because of that hunger. You, know, you think of all the, the arguments that happen within marriage. It's because you're not loving me enough. You're not recognizing me enough. You're not respecting me enough. That's that hunger speaking. You think of all the effort we... we used to you know, pursue greatness in the world, pursuing your career. By and large, it's driven by that hunger. You know, I was reading a story the other day of a man who had trained as a lawyer and he was talking about how he was just driven to seek the next promotion and the next promotion, to work his way up through the company. And he suddenly woke up one day and he realised I'm working so hard to get promotions to a job that I really don't want to do and to work with people that I hate. But there is such a deep need for significance to be recognised that I'm good. And that was driving him every single day. It's really important that you get in touch with that hunger because that is the story of your life. Now, in some sense, I think we could say that that hunger is actually also the whole story of the Bible. This might sound really simplistic, but if I was to explain the whole Bible to you in one sentence, the Old Testament is about hunger and the New Testament is about food. Now, let me explain, because this might explain the whole of human history to you. The Garden of Eden starts off with a command, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We only survive, you know, three chapters. By chapter three, we've, we've fallen into that hunger. And it talks about how Eve looked at the fruit and it was delightful to the eyes, it was pleasant to the taste, it was going to satisfy her deepest need, and everything was messed up ever since. As you read through every story after that in, in the Old Testament, you're seeing people driven by that neediness. You, know, you get to the story of, uh, of, of Jacob and his brother Esau. Don't know whether you're familiar with that story. But e Esau was the oldest son. He was the one who was going to receive the inheritance, the, his father's blessing. And he comes home one day and he's so hungry, he says to his brother, look, I'll do anything for food. I'll trade you my, my birthright. I'll trade my inheritance for the sake of that food. And so for a bowl of lentils, he sacrifices everything. Very much in the same way people would be prepared to sacrifice eternal life for the sake of a small bit of instant gratification. You get to the story of King David. Righteous man, honoured in the sight of God, and yet at the end of his days, that hunger takes over. He sees another man's wife and he desires her and he commits adultery. And then to cover his tracks, he arranges for the husband to get killed. You go to David's son, Solomon, once again, regarded as the wisest man on earth. And yet there is still this gnawing emptiness inside of him. He feels like to be a true man, he's got to have the biggest army, the most wealth, the biggest house. 
and he just becomes driven for more and more and more and the whole kingdom starts to collapse. You know, I could go on, but basically every story is this sense of the human heart craving for something which it can't find. Now, this is where we get to the New Testament. As I say, the New Testament is all about food. And because it starts with God becoming human in the town of Bethlehem. I'm not sure whether you're aware of this, but the, the name Bethlehem means house of bread. And when Jesus is born, he's placed in a manger. A manger is a food trough. It's a place where animals eat. So here is God, born in the house of bread, placed in a food trough. And then when he starts his ministry, almost every parable he tells repeatedly is about food. Heaven is like a wedding banquet. You know, he talks to the the woman at the well a woman who's deeply thirsty, and he says, if only you knew who you're talking to, you'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give you living water. At one of the feasts, Jesus goes into the temple, and he stands up, and he shouts out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who is, who is desperately hungry come, and I'll feed them. You know, it's that, it's that, that yearning that he wants to fulfill. And this is where it brings us to the gospel today. When the people are hungry, Jesus gives them an abundance, this overflowing miracle of bread. Now, as we're going to hear next week, straight away the people want to make him king. They, they, they're in love with this man because he's suddenly satisfied their need. But he goes on, he says, you're not looking for bread, you're looking for something deeper. And I am the thing you are looking for. I am the bread of life. I am the thing that is going to satisfy your deepest yearning. The reason why this is so important is that a lot of people today would look at Christianity and say, you know, it's not for me. And a lot of Christians would look at the Catholic Church and say, I don't think I need to do the Catholic thing all that stuff around the Eucharist. It's just a nice little pious devotion. It's not actually necessary for salvation. And yet really what Jesus is trying to say here is that this is the the whole narrative of salvation. God wants to reveal himself as food for our need. He wants to enter into that deepest part of our soul which cannot be satisfied with anything else. The Eucharist is not just an optional extra. It's not just a pious devotion. It is the very meaning of life. We need to come here aware that this is where he's going to satisfy us. There's a great quote by Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict was speaking to young people at World Youth Day. And he basically says, Dear young people, the happiness you are seeking the happiness that you have a right to enjoy has a name and a face. It is Jesus of Nazareth hidden in the Eucharist. Only he gives the fullness of life to humanity. Such a powerful quote because the Pope there was just saying, this is the meaning of life. This is the thing you crave for. And until we can connect our hunger with the food, we will never be satisfied. You know, I think this is maybe the great tragedy that, that so many Catholics who come to, to Mass every Sunday never actually connect their hunger with the Eucharist. You know, we sit here during Mass thinking about all the stresses of work, all the burdens we've got facing us next week, all the stuff that we are dreaming of that's going to maybe satisfy us. And we're blind to the fact that the very thing that can satisfy us is in front of us. I I sometimes think that we almost need to develop a spirituality of hunger, if I could put it this way. We need to have at the core of our whole spirituality this idea of coming to the Lord who wants to feed us. Anytime you find yourself struggling with sin or temptation, 
the classic response is we either justify ourselves, we try and rationalise it, or we hide in shame. We feel that God is not happy with us and so we're going to just be in denial. When really what he wants is for us to come to him and say, God, I'm hungry, feed me. You know, the fact that I'm tempted right now is because my soul is yearning for you. Turn the temptation into a prayer. In the same way that your child would scream and shout if they were hungry, that's the appropriate response. Shout out to God and say, God, I'm going to go do something stupid right now unless you reveal your love in a deeper way, unless you become the bread of life for me. Now, this is, this is actually pretty much how St. Therese of Lisieux presented her spirituality. If you read her writing, she, she had such an overwhelming confidence in God's love. Whenever she was tempted, she would basically say to God, the reason I'm tempted to sin right now is because you're not giving me enough love. You need to love me more, and then I won't be going after that rubbish. You know, it's like... If you could imagine someone being presented with the most amazing banquet and yet they go and start eating out of the rubbish bin. That's the way we live. We need to realise that this banquet of love present in the Eucharist is given to us every day. There is nothing stopping us from coming every single day to this banquet. If we are aware of that deep yearning inside of us, but also aware of the deep yearning in the heart of Jesus that he wants to satisfy us. So let's come into the Eucharist today deeply aware of that hunger and ask that he can reveal his love in a deeper way than we've ever known before.